and special welcome if anyone is joining us for the first time. If you are joining us for the first time, you can view recordings of past sessions using the link in the email that you received earlier today. Uh, we're so pleased to have Professor David Fishman teaching us today. Um, the session title is When Jews Made Fellow Jews Other, Hasidism and Its Opponents. Um, I already know that this is a great session and I'll tell you why, because um, JTS produces something that we call uh, turnkey curricula. These are um, complete courses that can be taught in adult education settings. We have video lectures and a source book and a leader's guide. Um, and our newest course is called Beyond Dispute, Debates That Shape Jewish Life. And Professor uh, Fishman's session today um, comes from that curriculum. So I'm mentioning it to you because if your community has not, um, has not done the Beyond Dispute curriculum, it's it's an awesome if if I do say so myself, and uh, you should be in touch with your rabbi or adult ed chair um, to bring it to your community. Um, we want to thank our sponsors uh, of today's session at the Chacham level, Barbara and Ron Fetterman, in honor of their children and grandchildren. Thank you so much to the Fettermans. And if you're feeling inspired by this opportunity to engage in Jewish learning with JTS's outstanding scholars, we want to invite you to consider partnering with us by sponsoring a learning session as the Fettermans have done. We have two sponsorship levels, Chacham for $540 and Sadiq for 1000. And to learn more, uh, you can contact learninglives at jtsa.edu. We will put all of that in the chat. And I now turn things over to Tani Schwartz Herman to uh, walk us through a few more details. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so uh, just to go over the Q&A for today's session, uh, Dr. Fishman will pause for questions periodically throughout the class. <clears throat> we will also have a Q&A period at the end. Uh, you can use the chat feature to submit your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman to open the chat, hover your cursor over the bottom of the Zoom screen and click on the chat icon. During the Q&A period, Rabbi Andelman will select a few of the questions to present to Dr. Fishman. Uh, please note that you will only be able to chat with JTS staff. You will not be able to send messages to the group or to Dr. Fishman. Uh, for technical or logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with myself or with Lynn Feynman. Um, the sources for today's class were in the email that you received with the Zoom link for the session uh, this morning. Um, we'll also be screen sharing the sources as well. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. David Fishman, uh, Professor of Jewish History at JTS, um, and his full bio you can find um, in the sources as well. So I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to him. Uh, can everybody hear me? I guess so. I'll see some heads shaking and I'll know that um, all is well. Uh, good afternoon, at least here in New York, it's afternoon, and happy to participate in this series. And uh, I was looking at the topics that many of you have heard already, and they're fascinating, and now I'm regretting I didn't attend. Um, my topic today, as far as the other, is actually how Jews can make fellow Jews the other. And... Um, <clears throat> consider them enemies um, and tr internal Jewish strife. Uh, now, we all know internal Jewish strife. This is always a, a relevant topic, a contemporary topic. We think of denominational strife, orthodox and ultra-orthodox against conservative and reform. We think of political strife, the left versus the right in Jewish life. I'm going to take you back to internal Jewish strife and conflict and really vilifying other Jews by Jews to a period of 250 years ago. I was thinking just now before the founding of our nation, before the American Revolution, some of the events happened after the American Revolution. So uh, it's a different time. It's a different place. I'll need your imagination and your patience to imagine how things were um, back then. I'm going to teach more or less the way I teach at JTS, which is I like to show a lot of slides and I'm going to be showing a lot of visuals. 
Um, you will see me from time to time, but I find it, it keeps more attention for you to, to, to build on the images. And uh, then we'll look at one or two texts, especially in the middle part of the talk, right? There are three sections here. First, I have to give you a thumbnail sketch of what Hasidism is and how it came to be. Second, we'll talk about the Mitnagdim, the great opponents of the Hasidim that emerged in the late 18th century. And the conflict, I wrote here, I don't know if you can see the numbers, the years 1772 to 1804. And if we have time, and we'll have, I think, some time, some broader reflections on this conflict, this controversy, its causes and its um, consequences. And we will stop for questions. And now comes the moment of truth where I, if I can share my screen, all is well. Ah, here we are. Okay. The founder of Hasidism, Israel Ben Eliezer, better known as Israel Baal Shem Tov, sometimes Baal Shem Tov is abbreviated as Besht, right? Lived, as you can see, from 1698 to 1760. Uh, he lived in what is today Ukraine, uh, in a region known as Podolia. So we're talking about Eastern Europe and actually the Southern part. This is where the region where Israel Baal Shem Tov was, no, uh, was active. The name Baal Shem Tov means master of the good name, meaning the master of God's name. Uh, and the Baal Shem Tov was, one of his roles was as a magical healer. He was a, if you could say, a faith healer. And he used God's name in different permutations and different versions to bring healing to people. Um, and that's how he got that name the, as the Baal Shem Tov. But he's really got three roles. You can look here. We, uh, let me first give you as background. Uh, like many founders of new religious movements, he, did, he never wrote a book. And we don't have uh, really original writings by the Baal Shem Tov. Uh, we do have what I showed you here on the right, which is one or two letters, which we believe are authentic. Uh, written to family mother, members, uh, but that would not get us very far um, as far as his teachings. Fortunately, we have two other things. We have collections of his teachings by his students and his student students. They did write books. And then we have um, a collection of his life, stories about his life, legends, one really could say, this book, Shivchei Baal Shem Tov, Shivchei Habesh, which appeared in 1815. So more than 50 years after his death, we get this collections of stories about him. Uh, the Baal Shem Tov, we know more about his teachings than we know about his life, more reliably, I should say. He was, as I said, a magical healer. He was a mystic. That is, he claimed to have real mystical experiences of uniting with God and the divine realm. And this letter on the right actually describes his experiences during prayer on Rosh Hashanah of 1746. Uh, and third, and maybe uh, very interesting and important, he developed a circle of students. Uh, Baal Shem Tov did not have a mass movement behind him, but he did have 15, 20 students. And over the course of the decades of his life, that circle grow, grew to probably hundreds of people, maybe a few thousand, but certainly no more than a few thousand who consider themselves to be um, his followers. Now, I haven't got a lot of time. I'm going to make this short. Um, the basic teachings of the Baal Shem Tov, which became the central the teachings of Hasidism, were one, Devekut. Devek in Hebrew is glue. Devekut means gluing or sticking. The idea of cleaving to God, of uniting with God, of experiencing God directly. This is the central ideal and value in Hasidism. And the main way you cleave to God, not the only way, but the main way is through prayer. Prayer is supposed to be not just saying the words and understanding them and asking God for things, uh, 
that from the Bashemta's perspective would have been a very superficial prayer to ask God for things. Prayer is a tool for a kind of mystical experience to be right there with God. And that's what should happen when you say the Amidah or the Shema, that you feel you're in a different universe and a different level. Also, Chassidism taught Dvekut, uniting with God, can happen during just about anything you do. You can be making shoes. You can be banging with a hammer. You can be a tailor and making clothing. If you have this deep religious consciousness, and especially a consciousness that that hammer was made by God, and the thread and the needle were made by God, and they exist thanks to God. You can experience Dveikut even as you make those shoes or make that shirt. So Dveikut should infuse all of your life in Hasidic teaching, but especially um, prayer. The second foundation of Hasidic teachings is the idea of the Rebbe or the Tzaddik, that the Baal Shem Tov himself was the model of that, a new type of religious leader, a religious leader who is a leader by virtue of being a mystic, that is a model of someone who can cleave to God, who can unite with God, who has these extra body experiences of going up to heaven and, and connecting with the divine. So the, the tzaddik is a leader who is a mystic. Second, and a consequence of that, someone who can perform miracles because they're in close contact with the divine, they can often influence the divine. They can influence God and therefore change the course of events uh, in, in our world and cause what we consider to be a miracle. And third, the Rebbe, the Tzaddik, Tzaddik means righteous person or saint, but it's a synonym in the 18th century for Hasidic rabbi, Hasidic Rebbe. He is a teacher and he's a guide of a community of followers. So, okay, I'll come back to this in a minute, uh, but I, I think it's fair to say um, a new central religious ideal, mystical, a new type of leader was not particularly focused on learning Talmud, but is focused on the mystical and the miracle. And finally, closeness to God and joy. Joy is a basic Hasidic teaching. We should be joyful, first of all, because God, God is in this world. Uh, but second of all, we should be joyful because it's the only way to draw close to God. If you'll be depressed, if you'll be uh, dejected, if you'll be rem you know, remorseful and full of guilt, you'll never experience God. So joy is necessary in order to experience God. And so therefore, very early on, Hasidim were focused on singing and on dancing and on drinking, all stimuli to make one joyous because in that kind of cheerful mood you can and will experience God. Now something about Hasidic prayer and then I'll, um, uh, uh, of course as I said the central religious value is prayer not Torah study. It's not an intellectual Judaism. It's a Judaism of the spirit and of the heart, but not of the mind. You don't study, you can study, but study is not the central event. Uh, mystical union with God is the central there. Hasidic prayer tends to be ecstatic in style, a lot of shaking of the body, a lot of <coughs> shouts and sounds. It's not about restraint. And uh, Hasidim in, uh, introduced the liter a different liturgy, not the traditional Ashkenazic liturgy, but the liturgy that the Kabbalists in Sfat in the 16th century in the land of Israel used, established by Isaac Luria, known as Nusach Ha'ari. It's closer to the Sephardic, and it is a variation of the Sephardic liturgy. So the order of prayers is different. Some of the texts are different, but this was an important break with tradition that Hasidim prayed, um, not the way Ashkenazic Jews, East European Jews had prayed for centuries, but they adopted the prayer book of the Kabbalists. And two other peculiarities about Hasidic practice. One is Hasidim early on developed a practice of not rushing to begin their prayers. Uh, you can't rush the heart and the spirit, and you have to really be ready to have kavanah or intention. And therefore Hasidim often missed the prescribed times of prayer. 
they would have mincha, the afternoon prayers, when it was already dark out at night. Or they would uh, daven shachari, the morning prayers, when it was already really, according to the laws of the prayer, too late to say the morning Shema or the morning Amidah. So they were not meticulous about times. Because they put intention above everything else, they were often um, not keeping the, the halachot about times of prayer. Finally, Hasidim had their own form of shechita, of ritual slaughter. Of, of animals for kosher preparation of kosher meat. Hasidim used a different type of knife. Um, it was honed uh, in a different way. And uh, Hasidim, already in the late 18th century, were only eating Hasidic meat and not any other kind of uh, meat prepared uh, under any other um, rituals. Um, here you can see on the right a Hasidic prayer book. And if you know some Hebrew, you can see it says, Al pi nusach ha'ari, according to the ritual of the Ari, Isaac Luria. And this is the first printed he, uh, Hasidic book, um, Yaakov Yosef of Polnoyes, Toldot Yaakov Yosef, printed in 1780. And the last thing I want to say in this section, well, I may have two, forgive me. But uh, I did want to say something about the spread of Hasidism. If you can see, Hasidism started in this, really in this town where the Baal Shem Tov lived, Mejbuz, which I'm, uh, you're, you're all blocking me. I must get you out of there, sorry. Um, here we are. This is Mejbuz. Not a great map, but the point is, um, I'll, I'll make my main point, but it spreads in a next generation or two throughout all of Eastern Europe. Although it began in one sort of uh, corner of Ukraine, uh, the Baal Shem Tov um, did not have sons. And therefore, when he died, the leadership was not passed on to his son, but it was passed on to a um, disciple, Dov Ber of Mizrich. And if I can show it here, up here, a little further north, from Mezhbe is, is Mizrich, and Dober was the leader in what's called the second generation of Hasidism, the generation after the Baal Shem Tov. And then uh, when Dober of Mezrich died, the leadership became decentralized, and it was taken by many disciples of either the Baal Shem Tov or of Dober and moved to many different places, right? So Lubavitch is up here in Belarusia. And uh, Amdur is here in what is uh, sort of Eastern Poland. And so what you're getting in the third generation is many leaders. It's no longer a unific unificatory movement with a centralized leadership, but there are um, many variants and versions of Hasidism that emerged. This third generation, which is the explosion of Hasidism as it's going to all corners of Eastern Europe, um, this happens in the 1780s, 1790s, actually the same period of the great controversy I'm gonna talk about. Now, of course, I don't want to, um, Hasidic masters are seen as um, superhuman. They are intermediaries between the divine and simple human beings. They are treated like royalty. I wanted to show you something. These are um, sort of the, the courts or the, uh, the centers of Hasidic masters usually where they live is made into an enormous complex, right? Almost like the kind of fortresses or castles that Polish nobility had or Polish kings had. This is the court in Sadeger. This is actually um, the synagogue of the Rebbe of Sadeger. And this is the home of the uh, Rebbe of Sadeger. And this is uh, the home of the Chortkova Rebbe. And so uh, the main institution that develops is the Hasidic court and of Hasidim making pilgrimages to these courts to be with the Rebbe and to, um, uh, to spend time praying with him, to have private meetings with him. And uh, let me get out of this for a minute. I'm gonna take questions in a minute. But um, I think 
If you ask me on one foot, what made this small movement in one little corner of Ukraine spread throughout Eastern Europe so that after 50 years, uh, from the 1740s to the 1790s, by the 1790s and by 1800, this is a movement that has got hundreds of thousands of followers, not hundreds, not thousands, but hundreds of thousands. Why is this movement so successful, which is a big question scholars ask. Um, I will give you two of answers that I think are compelling. Um, one is the style of leadership. Hasidic Rebbe's uh, met privately and personally with their followers and were their mentors and guides in every aspect of their life, whether it was business, whether it was family, whether it was matters of religion and faith. And I think that style of leadership of really, uh, you felt that the Rebbe connected with you and everything that you were going through in your life. I think that really made Hasid, as opposed to, I must say, the rabbinate of the late 18th century, the established rabbinate, which was immersed in study and immersed in bookish learning, um, but was not seen as being this kind of personal, intimate um, mentor and guide. And the second reason I would give, and believe me, this is discussed at length, but I'll still go with this one, is I think the Hasidic doctrine of joy made uh, Judaism accessible to followers. Uh, in other words, well, anybody can sing and basically dance. This, uh, you know, there are different levels of ability, but everybody can celebrate, everybody can party. And when it's made into a religious commandment, it's a central religious act, that made Hasidism a kind of Judaism that, um, that was open to everybody. A Judaism that focused on learning, on knowledge of the Talmud in Hebrew Aramaic, uh, that's a very elitist Judaism. Only of the few can, 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 um, can achieve that. And here what was offered was, and everybody can achieve whatever their level will be. Not everybody will do the Vekut of the highest level, but everybody can, can, can celebrate God's presence. Uh, to finish up uh, this part, I just want to say quite clearly, Hasidism is a new, and one could even say rebellious version of Judaism compared to what it existed before it arose and before um, it spread. It had its own values, it, uh, which were slightly different than the values of Judaism beforehand. It had its own leaders who were different than um, the uh, leaders beforehand. And it had its own practices the way they prayed, the shrita they did, which were different. So it really is a new upstart in Judaism in the 18th century. And that's what's going to lead to the conflict I'll talk to you about after um, this break for questions. So let me take questions. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question about how, how significantly did the movement, <clears throat> excuse me, um, penetrate the area? What what percentage of Jews were um, affiliating or identifying with Hasidism in the first and or second generation of, uh, of the leadership? It's a great question and it's hard to answer, you know, about things like this. We didn't have opinion polls back in the late 18th century. We often don't have, um, you know, the statistics we'd love to give accurate questions. Um, so we, uh, we sort of work, when we do know, we do see Hasidic prayer houses uh, in many parts of Eastern Europe by 1800. And actually I have to jump ahead and say uh, uh, something I would probably have said later. Hasidism spreads in Ukraine and further west to the region known as Galicia and northwest to the region of, uh, known as Congress Poland, it, where it fails the most is when it tries to move north to the region that Jews called Lithuania or uh, Litvax. Um, so we have a sense of where it's taking hold and where it's not um, taking hold. And uh, just the last thought, which is really interesting, as you're gonna see, there are gonna be a lot of rabbinic 
decrees prohibiting Hasidism, but they get repeated many, many times. There's no sign, a better sign that that movement to prevent the spread of Hasidism is failing than the fact that they keep on repeating, do, do not follow the Hasidim, do not follow the Hasidim. So I think we're pretty confident that a large percentage of East European Jews were Hasidic to a greater or lesser extent by the year 1800. Great, thank you. Um, there's actually several people are asking about um, how, if, if Hasidism was kind of a friendlier form of Judaism for women, and, um, and, and there was also a question about, did it appeal more to the, to the poor and working class who, who wouldn't have had access to what, was, uh, what might have been considered higher education at the time? Hasidism and women is a big topic that is now very much studied and debated among mm -hmm. scholars in this field. Um, I don't think it was oriented towards women. I still think this is the late 1700s in Eastern Europe and any ideas about um, women's equality have, have not penetrated. Um, I think if anything, there are those scholars who believe that Hasidism, well, there, there are two parts, but many believe that Hasidism actually harmed the role of women because it took men away from their families for major holidays. Men made pilgrimages often without their wives and children um, for major holidays like Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. So that it, there are scholars that believe it was really disruptive to the family. Uh, on the other hand, if you want a more positive image, more positive image is that um, uh, because everything is infused with godliness, definitely the sexual act and love, um, erotic life were also infused with godliness and holiness. And the relationship between husband and wife now became part of this great drama of of, uh, of connecting with God. So there are two sides to the story and it's not clear. Um, I, I can see both sides to the story as far as um, women and Hasidism. I, I can say there's no official role for women in the structure of Hasidism. Um, the working class and the poor. Uh, yes, mainly yes, but not only yes. In other words, Hasidism still has a hierarchy. Obviously, the big donors who are, are close to the Rebbe, I don't want to make Hasidism into some kind of socialist movement. Um, the big donors are close to the Rebbe and they get much more access and much more attention. Um, and there is an elite of spirituality. In other words, the people who know Kabbalah and who know how to unite with God are, are given higher esteem and, uh, than people who don't. But nonetheless, I'd have to say the floor was lifted. <laughs> In other words, there's still a hierarchy with higher up and lower down, but the lower down now have dignity, now have value because they too can participate in this quest for un uniting with God. Do you want to take one more question? I can take one more. You know. Okay, because there are a lot of questions about things that I know you're about to discuss um, after this Q&A. So those of you who are asking big questions about why everyone was so threatened, don't worry, he'll, he'll get to that. Um, just a kind of a smaller question, actually, but a few people were asking um, about what, what what kind of... Um, you know, philosophical or ideological difference could there be behind different uh, practices in ritual slaughter? Okay, there are philosophic ideas behind it. They're very much Kabbalistic. It had to do with uh, the whole idea of it. Animal souls, when they depart this world, can enter the body of a human being or another animal. This idea of Gilgul Hanefesh, that the soul, transmigration of the soul, and that you need a certain kind of knife and a certain kind of slaughter in order to enable that soul to leave the body. These are technical matters. I think much more important than that is the spirit of Hasidism, which was a spirit of experimentation. 
and innovation. And that's what's done in prayer. Uh, a new style of prayer, a little bit of a different liturgy. And I think that's what's going on with Shkita Hasidism, renewed Judaism in the sense that it was willing to uh, try things differently, not necessarily violating halakha, a little bit sometimes, yes, but mostly not. But um, I think it's the spirit of innovation that drew them to say, you know what, we could do Shkita a different way too. Okay, I'm going to move on um, and get back to my pictures. And okay, here we are. Uh, this is again a different map. We're now under Russian rule in the late 18th century. Most of Eastern Europe came under Russian rule. And again, Podolia the, is the region where Hasidism started. And as I said, it moves to other parts of Ukraine, it moves to Galicia and to Poland, but it's when it moves straight up north that it encounters this fierce opposition, especially in the community of Vilna, the, of Lithuania, the Jerusalem of Lithuania, as it's called, Yerushalayim Vilita. And this is the man who you could almost say is single-handedly responsible um, for the fierceness of the opposition, the Vilna Gon, Elijah, Rabbi Eliyahu of Vilna. Uh, his dates are 1720 to 1797. He embodied, as you can see in this portrait with the big library behind him, the kind of very intellectual Judaism, that the greatest um, act in Judaism, the central act, is not prayer, but is study. That the way to connect to God is through connecting to God's words. And that is the words in the written Torah, in the Chumash, or the words of the Halakha in the Talmud. So he already had, before um, Hasidism moved north, um, a totally different worldview on what is most important in Judaism. And he's a cultural hero for Lithuanian Jewry. He also gets a biography full of legends about him. Aliot Eliyahu, and he even had his portrait hanging up on the homes of many um, Lithuanian uh, Jews. And he is known in Lithuanian circles as Eliyahu Gaon the Chassid Mivilna, the Gaon, the genius, and the Chassid. It's very funny. And you, uh, yes, he considers himself not a Chassid in the sense of Hasidism, but a pietist a saintly and pious, but it's a different version of, of piety, of saintliness. It's a version which says of mild asceticism, to deny the body, to give the body the minimum it needs to sustain the mind. Uh, in other words, yes, you should eat and drink, but only in, uh, to the extent necessary so you can think and study. And the Gon famously studied, uh, slept very little uh, at night. Um, and he is the man behind the uh, first um, excommunication against Hasidim in 1772. And here I'm going to try to uh, get to a different uh, screen share and ask uh, Tani to read one of the texts I sent you. We can't look at all of them today, but uh, the text that I sent that is number five. Um, I'm sorry, uh, let me move up to number five is um, I think really, in, this is a part of the text of the first ban excommunication of the Hasidic movement. Go ahead, Tanya. Uh, to our beloved brethren, the chosen of God, who follow the ways of their ancestors and observe the way of the Lord, you have surely heard that a new group has arisen, not imagined by our ancestors, who call themselves the Hasidim. In every city, they form an association of those who leave the established synagogues and houses of study, separating themselves from the community, as it says in Pirkei Avot, and the earth was split open by their uproar and in Kings 1, the uproar of their house of prayer, 
their practices are different, they have changed the liturgy coined by our sages. They have abandoned Torah study and spend all their days in frivolous speech and debauchery. They dishonor the famous and extraordinary Torah scholars of our generation. All their days are like holidays and they believe they are rewarded for refraining from Torah study as is well known. Now, please listen, brothers, take to heart and see the consequences of this sect. Aren't the earlier troubles we had from such sects enough? Now a new one has sprung forth. As it says in Deuteronomy, a stock sprouting poison, weed, and wormwood. Whoever hears and sees these words should gird his loins like a man and turn their evil intention against them to fight them off and pursue them as much as Jews have the ability. And from there, we must disperse them so that they not gather in a minion. Okay, thank you, Tan. Um, I mean, if I go through what's argued here, first of all, that they leave the established synagogues and houses of study. They're separatists. And that's sort of true because Hasidim had their own um, ritual, their own liturgy. If you have your own liturgy, you've got to have your own synagogues. And instead of going to the already established synagogues, um, <clears throat> they prayed in their own uh, synagogues and therefore separate themselves from the established community. They're sectarian, they're separatists. Other things that are mentioned here, I'm just sort of unpackaging it because it's all so dense, right? When it says the earth was split open by their uproar, the uproar of their houses of prayers, what they're talking about is this shocking new style of prayer. Make all the noise, the screaming, the, yes, the loud singing, uh, the ecstatic nature, right? They've changed the liturgy. In other words, some of these things are just about, they didn't, they're not following our tradition. And here, this is a very conservative, uh, small c uh, community, where if, you know, if our ancestors have done this for hundreds of years, how dare you change what our ancestors, so it's seen as an affront that you would change the liturgy that Ashkenazic and East European Jews have used for hundreds of years. Um, They've abandoned Torah study, right? And spend their days in frivolous speech and debauchery. Of course, these are distortions. They are, every distortion has some kind, most distortions have some kind of grain of truth. Um, but definitely has to say Hasidism has de-emphasized Torah study uh, compared to other activities. This is seen here as abandoning it and just spending your day in frivolous speech. They dishonor the famous and extraordinary Torah scholars of our generation, sort of that flows from that. If you don't study Torah, then why would you have reverence for the scholars of the Torah? All their days are like holidays. I love that one, right? Another, kol um, yimem they, you know, that they just, they just, you know, spend their time drinking and singing and having lots of fun. Okay. And of course, what's important is not only the description this kind of polemical description of Hasidism, but the, the bottom line, this is written as a call to arms, right? And so, so whoever hears and see these words, right? Should turn their evil intention against them, fight them off, pursue them as much as Jews have ability. And from there, we must disperse them so that they not gather in a minute. Uh, we are, in late 18th century Eastern Europe. We are not in late 18th century America. And that's important because these people, the Mitnagdim, the opponents of Hasidism, do not have any conception of um, freedom of speech, religious pluralism, um, or uh, they uh, claim to speak on behalf of the correct and true Judaism. And they see this new movement as a, a falsehood, a sinful. And therefore, this is a, what you're going to get here is a violent campaign. Behind those words, and we don't have the time to go into all the texts, what emerges is a violent campaign among Lithuanian Jewish communities and some others against class citizen. People are fired from their jobs. <laughs> People are excommunicated. And what that means is, no one will talk to them. No one will do business with them. They will be shunned in the synagogue. If they die or someone in their family dies, they will not be buried on the Jewish cemetery. There are many, many consequences, very severe and very grave to being excommunicated. And Hasidim and Hasidism 
is ex are excommunicated. We know not from these official documents, but from other documents that uh, in certain communities, this is a real violent campaign. People are drowned in the river anonymously. People are uh, beaten by unknown assailants. But um, uh, in the community of Vilna, there was actually a, a position of someone who is basically a official, I guess we have to say official uh, thug of the community. In other words, someone who says, you hound Hasidim, do whatever you can do, do whatever you want to do, don't tell us about it. We don't want to know, the community leaders say to him. So there's a position of someone whose job is to pursue and persecute. This is a violent, um, it is not only a religious debate, it is, um, a, and most of the time, the Hasidim are the victims, but not all of the times, because these things go in cycles. And when Hasidim have the possibility to um, exact retribution, to take revenge, they take revenge uh, to wh whichever ways they could. For instance, in Vilna, they inform on the leaders of the Vilna Jewish community to the Russian government. The Russian government starts an investigation, fires everybody, all the leaders of the Vilna Jewish community, uh, and, and imposes actually a Hasidic community on Vilna for one year. So you can see how these things are never totally one-sided. Once there's violence on one side, there is also there was also um, counter violence. Let me get back to the pictures. Um, and there are waves. 1772, 1781, 1781 because the first Hasidic book was printed in 1780. That first Hasidic book from 1780 had very harsh words against Talmudists, uh, those who study the Talmud. That book again, Yaakov Yosef of Polnoya. And that's the only other text we have time to look at today but let me get it for you. This is, um, that I'll ask again, Tani. This is a text from the very first Hasidic book, 1780, which will lead to the backlash of more uh, bans against Hasidism in 1781. Okay, go for it, Tani. The purpose of the entire Torah and the mitzvot, the reason they were given is in order that one can have the privilege of attaching oneself to God. May he be blessed as it is written, in Deuteronomy, to him shall you hold fast. But with the passing of the years, hearts have grown smaller and people fail to understand this matter. Instead, they make the Torah into a crown with which to aggrandize themselves, um, as it says in Pirkei Avot, and to glorify themselves. When one learns a single law, one glorifies oneself a bit. And when one learns more, one glorifies oneself more. Behold the Talmudic scholars who break their footsteps going from city to city to study Talmud. This explains the verse, why do you break and stray even further as it says in Isaiah. The more they break their footsteps to go to yeshiva to study, the more they stray and distance themselves from God. Here, what you got is a Hasidic text saying, you know, those who are just studying all the time, it accuses them in a sense of, of self-interest and hypocrisy. They're only studying, you know, to aggrandize themselves, to glorify themselves. They've forgotten that study is not the end goal. That, um, and, and their, the end goal is to hold fast to God. And therefore, and this is sort of the hard, the very harsh punchline, the more they are walking, breaking their footsteps from one yeshiva to another yeshiva, the more they are walking away from God. They think that they're, you know, righteous, but really they've forgotten what it's all about. It's not about the word on the page. It's about God. So obviously comments like that, that these people are just out for the glory and honor, and they've totally forgotten about God, that leads to the second um, uh, wave of um, <coughs> excommunications of the Hasidic movement. Excuse me, gotta, gotta get back to here. Um, forgive me, this sometimes happens. Okay. And the culmination of this 
is in a third wave from 1796 to 1798. One of the leaders of the Hasidic movement in that third generation is Schneir Zalman of Yadi. And Schneir Zalman was the founder of Lubavitch Hasidism. And the Mitnagdim informed on him to the Russian government and he was arrested um, in 1798. Uh, on investigated, interrogated, actually held in prison for two months in St. Petersburg, in the capital of Russia. Uh, they investigated things like, uh, is he, has he created a new religion? You know, a non-authorized religion in the Russian empire. Uh, is he funneling money to an enemy of the Russian empire, Turkey? Now, of course it is true that Shneir Zaman was sending money to Turkey, he was sending money to the land of Israel where he had Hasidim and uh, the land of Israel was under Turkish rule. But these kind of trumped up and uh, uh, charges led to his arrest. Uh, and the day when he was liberated, the 9th of Kislev is still, uh, uh, a, uh, which is about a week before Hanukkah, is, um, is a, a holiday celebrated um, by Chabad Hasidim. Okay, uh, to finish this up, this section up, let me just say that uh, I brought you this map. This is a map of a small shtetl in, uh, in Galicia, because if you're able, I couldn't enlarge it anymore. One thing I wanted to show you here is uh, the situation calms down. The situation calms down in the early 1800s, um, in part because the Russian government stepped in and finally authorized that both versions of Judaism are, um, are permitted. The government was no longer going to be dragged into this. Hasidic synagogues are permitted. Mitnagdic synagogues are permitted. Both versions are permitted. Um, and also, one must say, the Vilna Gaon died. Vilna Gaon died 1797. And as the years can, passed on, the intensity, the, the man who was behind all of this, um, his absence made it possible for some kind of calm and reconciliation to occur. And now to come back to this map, what I wanted to show you is in this little shtetl, um, right, number uh, five is the Belzer Stiebel, the synagogue of the Belzer Hasidim, number nine and 10, Arbitriska Stiebel and the Radzina Stiebel, two very different Hasidic groups, but um, uh, also further down, let me just find it, you'll find number 13, the Shul, and number 14, the Besmedrish. The Shul and the Besmedrish are mitnagdic, non-Hasidic. What I wanted to show you here is you get a kind of, uh, in the 19th century, after 30 terrible years of conflict and bloodletting, you get a de facto kind of pluralism in East European Jewish communities where one town will have both Hasidim and Mitnagdim and many different types of Hasidim and they get along. Okay, I think I'll stop here for um, more questions. Okay. Um, so there's, there are questions about um, are there historical parallels to, to the rise of and reaction to Hasidism, um, specifically the Protestant Reformation and Counter-Reformation, and even going back further, um, Judaism and, and Christianity? There are definitely parallels. I wouldn't call them more than parallels. Um, what, what, in other words, I don't think they have much of a direct impact. Um, the, the Reformation and Counter-Reformation is a really interesting parallel because it literally took a hundred or more years of conflict between Catholics and Protestants until things quieted down and a de facto kind of Christian pluralism emerged. Now that Christian pluralism emerged in the 1600s. Um, so maybe even that could have been a kind of a antecedent to what happened here in, in um, the Jewish world. Of course, this is more recent. 
uh, than, than other examples, uh, than those other examples. Thanks. Um, there are questions about Shabtai Sfi and Messianism and Frankism, but I think, I think that's on the docket, right? No, but that's perfectly fine. I'm happy to deal with it now. Okay, so I think that'd be great. Um, okay, those people who are asking that question know a lot. Uh, and it sort of goes to one of the historical explanations of why the Mitnagim are so fierce in their <clears throat> combat against Hasidism, in their war against Hasidism. And that is there had been Jewish sects in the recent decades and centuries that had spread through Eastern Europe. Uh, there had been the false Messiah, Shabtai Tzvi, in 1665, 1666 someone who claimed to be the Messiah, and then actually was arrested by the Turks and converted to Islam. So it was a big letdown. In other words, obviously most Jews could no longer accept the man's Messiah when he's <clears throat> converted to another religion. Um, but more recent and more relevant is the matter of uh, Jacob Frank and the movement known as the Frankists. Frank, this emerges in Poland, in, and in fact in Podolia, in the 1750s. Frank claimed to be the reincarnation of Shabtai Tzvi, and he developed an underground sect of followers. Um, and his teachings were that he is the Messiah, and that in the day of the Messiah, the Torah is no longer valid. The Torah has been superseded. And in fact, things that had been sins before are now positive commandments. Of course, the worst thing, the, so the Frankists, those who followed secretly Jacob Frank, would eat non-kosher meat as a ritual, not just for fun or indulgence, but because they believe everything's inverted now. And so they intentionally, uh, as a religious ritual, ate non-kosher meat. And the worst thing, were their sexual practices, uh, incest, orgies. And so this is a sect, and it's very much on the mind, and as some of you may have noticed in the text that Tani read, where it says, we, haven't we already had enough trouble from sects? That's what it's referring to. It's referring to, especially to the, the Frankists, uh, who not only created religious turmoil by you know, basically permitting uh, incest and orgies, but also political turmoil for the Jews because the Frankists turn to the Catholic Church for protection against the Jewish community and allied itself with the church and started to spread all kinds of falsehoods about the Jews, uh, uh, including that the Talmud taught hatred of, of Christians, including the blood libel that Judaism required. So the Frankists became a real threat to the existence of East European Jewry. And so, um, yes, uh, there are two things to say here. One is, um, yes, the, to some extent, the Mitnagdim, it was a case of mistaken identity. The Mitnagdim saw a new sect, a new trend in Jewry. They'd sing and dance. No, that's not quite the same as orgies, but still this kind of wild joy going on here? Who knows what they do in secret when I know what they do in public? And so there was this assumption, this is yet another dangerous sect in Judaism, and it must be stopped, it must be nipped in the bud um, before it turns truly dangerous like the Frankists. So that's very important as background. The, uh, let me just add, the Vilna Go never met a Hasid in his life. Um, he gets second, third hand reports. And of course there are gonna be distortions. And uh, he certainly thought this uh, to him seemed just like the, the followers of Jacob Frank. Thank you. Um, do you wanna keep answering questions? I have plenty. Sure. Okay. Um, I thought this was an interesting question. Um, you know, the, the the label for the Minadim is li literally, um, it, it's only defined against Hasidim. Is there some other way to think of them, other 
another another term. All we're saying is the people who were against the Hasidim. Of course, that's the term that they got, right? That sometimes happens, just like Protestants are called Protestants because they are what they're against, um, not what they're for. Um, there, I will ex develop that a little bit in the next section, but let me just say, they're often also referred to, since in Israel today, they're referred to as Lithaim, the Lithuanians, right? And you may know the ultra-Orthodox in Israel today are really divided well into three groups into um, uh, ultra-Orthodox from the Eidol Tamizrach, from Oriental Jewish communities. And then among the Ashkenazim, the East Europeans, there are the Hasidim and the Litaim, the Lithuanians. The Lithuanians, that, as I explained, Litvak, Lithuanian Jew is basically a synonym for non or anti Hasidic um, Jew. What I will come to later is um, they do do something constructive. In other words, for 30 years, basically, they're a movement of people um, who, of what they're against, a movement of, uh, you know, voicing what they're against. Uh, they do turn after the uh, controversy calms down to constructive work. And I'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. Okay, so maybe one just one more for this segment. Okay. Um, there are a few people asking about how how much of the opposition was um, was against the whole concept of the tzaddik, and you know was was that in of itself threatening? And and a corollary question: Did that in turn influence the Nagdim and sort of have they thought of? Gidolim or or their masters. Uh -huh. um, okay, that reminds me. There's a broader topic of motives for opposition that I haven't talked about. Um, let me answer the question first, which is, it's interesting to see the Mitnagdim are not really focused on the issue of miracle working. You know that this is offensive, you know, these people claim to do miracles, they claim to do this and that. Remember, this is a dispute within traditional orthodoxy. This is not a dispute between more enlightened, rational, scientific thinking people and ultra-orthodoxy. That's often, it's misunderstood that way. These are two versions of traditional orthodoxy. Um, and therefore, it's really striking that, and you noticed in this bit rid of excommunication, it says nothing about the doctrine of the tzaddik, the idea of the tzaddik as, as a leader who you know, can perform miracles. Um, that's not on the, the Vilna Gaon himself claimed that he could perform miracles, uh, that he knew how to make a golem, to make a kind of humanoid using God's name, he could create like a robot. So the Vilna Gaon also was not, the Vilna Gaon was also a student of Kabbalah. Uh, so it, this does not break down between, you know, rational enlightened people and, you know, medieval ultra-religious people. No, they're both, it's two versions of piety. One which is about ecstasy, joy, supernaturalism, and the other which is about mainly study of text and rigid, meticulous observance of the law, right? So it's two versions of, of piety. It's, um, okay, I think I've made that question uh, clear. On my broader comment, I'll wait until we get to the next part. Okay. I'll I can take one more if you want to, or do you want me to move on? Ah, now you're muted, Rabbi Andelman. You're muted. I can't hear you. Sorry about that. Um, there, I'm almost tempted to ask you to go on. There, there are a lot of questions about okay. Hasidism today, but I'm, I'm, okay. I'm inclined to leave that till the end. Right. They're, they're great, because that we'll, have, we'll have time for more questions also from this section as we get to the end, um, to this third section. I sort of want to talk about... Um, causes, consequences, reasons for this explosion of internal Jewish violence and um, violent rhetoric. Um, first, let me divide it up into three types of opposition. I think there was this sincere religious opposition 
The Don Agon really thought, at the very least, this is a violation of the traditional Jewish scale of values. The most, the most valued Jew was the one who knew the Talmud well. And now along comes a movement that says, you know what, knowing the Talmud isn't so important. It's not as important as other things. So I think there are those who had authentic religious opposition to this movement. But secondly, one has to say, this movement was also a political threat to the established, um, let's say, power structure of East European Jews. You know, when someone splits off from a synagogue, even today, it weakens the existing synagogue uh, and uh, donations now flow in a different direction, right? When a lot of people stop going to the established synagogues. And that, uh, so it is a, a weakening of the established structures because people are creating a new structure. And there were people who were very, and, uh, very upset about that. Well, I'll make it even more vivid than that, right? The, by the way, the rabbinate is losing its authority because people are now not going to their local communal rabbi, but they go to a Hasidic rabbi instead. And uh, any religious question, whether it's theological, whatever, rabbis are losing their power. So there are issues of power here. If I'm going to make it very concrete, the political issues, I talked about shechita. Uh, Jewish communities taxed kosher meat. One of the ways Jewish communities had income for the different communal needs was there was a surcharge. Whenever you bought kosher meat, you were paying a little bit extra and it went to the kahal, to the Jewish community. You understand what that means? That means that when Hasidim create their own shechita, they are literally taking away tax money from the established Jewish communities who are noticing a drop in income. So there were those that are really um, upset about this movement because it is a political threat to sort of, let's say, vested interest. Um, third, this is sort of analytic way of looking at it. They couldn't be this analytic in the situation, but we have the benefit of distance to, to be analytic. Um, there's just the cultural opposition, which is, look at them, they do new things. They do things the way our parents, grandparents, great grandparents never did them. Like, I don't know, they pray from the Sidur of the Ari. Now, no one can say that praying from the Sidur of the, uh, of the Kabbalists is forbidden. After all, the Kabbalists did it, the Ari did it. You can't say it's forbidden, but it's simply the shock of innovation. You know, look, and they've changed the kind of knives for Shrita. They changed, they changed. I, know, I could give you a long list. So there is also just the, uh, you know, the, very, the ingrained conservatism that said, you know, we're, our, our way of life is to continue what our parents and grandparents and great grandparents did, not to change. Um, and that's a broader kind of cultural reaction among the um, Mitnagdim. Now, okay, let me do the constructive work and then I'll come back to other things in a minute. Um, I did mention that the Mitnagdim did something constructive. In 1802, actually, they established the first Lithuanian yeshiva, which is the yeshiva in Volozhin, the one here on the left. And it will be the first of many Lithuanian yeshivas. Uh, this is the other most famous yeshiva in uh, that region of Jewish Lithuania, the yeshiva in Mir. And you can even see here, a picture, right? The holy yeshiva, yeshiva Akdosha, Demir of Mir, uh, with a picture of every student, or the older students at least. Um, and what, uh, what I want to point out, these Lithuanian yeshivas are become these bastions of Talmud study. Uh, they're, they are, uh, they study the Talmud 24 hours a day. I'm not exaggerating. They had rotations. They had rotations of uh, students so that one night a week, there was a group of students who are studying Talmud through the night so that there not be a minute or a second when there is no study of the Talmud because the world could cease to exist. This is what they believe, that the Talmud is 
what keeps the universe functioning. And if, if so, therefore, what I'm trying to get at is these yeshivas are also large. Until then, there had not been large yeshivas. They'll get to be 400, 500 students. And uh, so this is sort of the turn of the mitnagdim from just being mitnagdim opponents to actually saying, you know what, if you think study is important, create institutions, you know, that will perpetuate that. And that's what they do uh, with Bolozhin and the other um, Lithuanian yeshivas. And Hasid, Hasidim did not have yeshivas. Hasidic yeshivas are something that came around almost 100 years later, close to the year 1900, you start to get Hasidic yeshivas. But uh, in the formative period of Hasidism, Hasidim had shtibles, they had uh, you know, houses of prayer, but they didn't have yeshivas because that was just not where what they thought was uh, important. Um, I'm now going to step back and, and just some final reflections on the causes of this um, controversy and why it quieted down eventually. Causes, they're always, you know, immediate and bigger background causes. But uh, let, let me say, um, bring in a couple of historical contexts um, to think about. We've mentioned one that came up to the question, which is about the Frankists and Jacob Frank and other sects, which uh, that's an important context. Another context is this is a time of trouble for the Jews of Eastern Europe and even for Poland and Eastern Europe in general. Um, it's in this period, right before it, in the 1760s, that a traumatic event happened to the Jews of Eastern Europe their umbrella organization of Jewish communities in Eastern Europe called the Vad Arbaratzot, the Council of Four Lands, was abolished. This was the pride and glory of East European Jewry that they had a council that brought together all communities under one roof uh, in a rather powerful body. That body was abolished by royal decree and so what I'm trying to tell you is the established community leadership really felt worried and threatened. I mean, uh, the, the organization we had no longer exists. And now we've got the enemy from within. It's not enough that the Poles have uh, weakened us, but we've got an enemy that's trying to weaken our communities from within. And then the next thing that happens is the Polish state itself collapses. This was a gradual process, but the Polish state collapses. And in 1772, 1793, 1795, most of Poland is simply gobbled up by Russia. By 1795, the state of Poland ceased to exist. And most of former Polish Jewry became Russian Jewry. And the reason this matters again is this is a time of tremendous turmoil. The Jews are now under new rule a state they didn't know nothing about, Russia. The arrangements they had for centuries are gone. So what I'm trying to tell you is, yes, under stress and in anxiety, uh, people get desperate. And I think this background of a time of troubles for Polish Jewry, worried about the future of its community, a time of troubles because Poland itself has collapsed, the anxiety and stress of the times really was a big factor in, in this reaction, which is we, we have to uh, stop Hasidism at all costs. Uh, I, I, I do want to say a point I made before, which is, of course, the, the effort to ban Hasidism, to suppress Hasidism, failed. It is by and large a monumental failure. Hasidism continues to spread and is a, was a vibrant movement uh, you know, that a large proportion of East European Jews uh, followed. So, um, and that's an interesting thing to point out. It's not hard to excommunicate a single person. And that is very effective in a community. If you say everybody shuns them, nobody talks with them, no one does business with them, no one marries their children, that works. But it actually, it's not so easy to excommunicate a community because they are their own community. 
So they'll have their own synagogue and have their own uh, friends. And so the effort to excommunicate Hasidim simply was on the face of it fell, fell uh, flat, let alone when, when the government got involved and said, you can't do that anymore. Finally, my final um, observation. Um, so that 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 uh, is why my observation on, you know, what why did this peter out? I mean, there is all kinds of strife in Jewry today, but there is virtually no strife, very little between Hasidim and Mitnagdim. Um, and I'll tell you an important reason why. Because the, the situation changed, the context changed. In the first half of the 19th century, you start to have the rise of the Haskalah movement, of the Jewish Enlightenment. And these are the Jews that we understand well and that to a large extent we identify with. These are the Jews who are urging fellow Jews to get a secular education to go to university, to know the language of the land in which you live fluently, to read its literature, to know its history, to be integrated as much as possible into the social life and the economy of your, of your country. And uh, the Haskalah uh, certainly downplayed religious piety compared to both Hasidim and Mithnagim. They're not uh, flaming atheists, uh, but still, for them, there has to be a shift. There's been too much of this religious study and uh, mystical quest. And what we need now is secular education and a focus on improving um, Jewry as part of the society in which Jews live. So the Haskalah, this new movement, the Jewish Enlightenment, it's a new enemy for both the Hasidim and for the Mithnagdi. In other words, both of these forms of ultra pious Jews now look at, the, uh, at them and say, well, these people are de-emphasizing pi, uh, the Pi. They don't want to study the Talmud and they don't want to you know, mystically unite with God. Uh, and they are the wave of the future. These Jews that are seeking some kind of Jewish modernity, some kind of uh, uh, combination of Jewishness with participation in broader society and culture. And my point is, all of a sudden, both movements realize, you know, the differences between us are small. I mean, they're differences of emphasis, uh, but compared to what we're facing with the Haskalah, uh, we really should unite. So context affects everybody. What your threat is, what your danger is, um, you know, how you judge that, changes everything. And um, therefore you have a sort of a rallying together of Hasidim and Mitnagdim to face this new third force um, in Jewish life, um, the Jewish enlightenment. Okay, now I'm ready for more questions. I think I'll stop there and take questions. They can range from the past to the present. Excellent. Um, there were a few questions about <clears throat> how how completely separate these two groups were, and maybe um, maybe that evolved over time. Um, I liked the way Joe put it. He wrote, "Would they eat in each other's houses, marry each other, pray in the other's synagogue if it was the only one in town, or while traveling? Um, or, or, or were they were they in contact, or or were they really split? The the common the common people of both." Um. That's a complicated topic, but let me try to make it simple. Marriages of children between Hasidim and Mitnagdim in the, in the first half of the 19th century are a big problem. And after all, marriages then are still arranged marriages by parents. And it's, uh, you know, it's uh, parents resist. And we have memoirs, we know this. Parents resist. I don't want Hasidim in my family, or I don't want. And so it does happen, but it's usually, um, <clears throat> it's not the norm, it's the exception. Um, eating each other's homes. Uh, in other words, I would say, maybe you have to see it as a kind of polite separateness. 
because eating the meat of the other is also a problem. Hasidim will only eat Hasidic meat, Mitnagdim will not eat Hasidic meat. Um, so though there was coexistence and there were, you know, as I showed you, many towns where you have both Hasidim and Mitnagdim, it's um, still a social boundary. And of course, it's not a problem in Lithuania where virtually everyone is Mitnagdim. And it's not a problem in certain other regions where virtually everyone was Hasidim. But in many regions, um, it's this kind of um, <clears throat> coexistence, but not mixing uh, for much of the 19th century. Thank you. Um, okay, so just before we get to today, um, there was there were several questions about how the the Hasidim themselves split into sects, and mm -hmm. you know how how did that happen? How how um, okay. was there animosity in those divisions as well? Yes, the short answer to that is yes, but we'll get that in a minute. As I was sort of alluding to, in this third generation of Hasidim, there's the Baal Shem Tov, and then there's Dover of Mezrich, his disciple, and then his disciples, the third generation, they go in all these different directions. That's really founds that third generation, when you have these many leaders, creates the multiplicity of Hasidic sects. It's from the third and then fourth generation that you start to get dyn Hasidic dynasties, right? In other words, so that Schneir Zalman of Yadi, the founder of Chabad Lubavitch, right? He will pass on the leadership to his son. And in other places, similarly, it's passed on to his son. And these become distinct groups. Um, they all have the same, if you want, spiritual lineage. They all go back to the Baal Shem Tov and revere the Baal Shem Tov. And there's some basic ideas they share. Um, but um, it, very much there, there are tensions between the different Hasidic groups. Um, there are turf wars because, you know, the different Hasidic groups say, this is my town and that's your town. This is my, and when they clash, but, the, but I can't, and there are differences between the different sects. There are many, you know, we only think of Lubavitch, but uh, before the Holocaust in Poland, Ger, the Ger Hasidim were the most numerous, the Belzer Hasidim um, were a, a very large group. Satmar was in Hungary. You know, I mean, if you have to say the top four Hasidic groups, that would be it. Lubavitch, Ger, Bels, Satmar. Um, there are differences, though the biggest difference usually is there are also floating Hasidim. What I mean by that is the biggest difference is which Rebbe do you believe in? Which one is the greatest miracle worker? Uh, which one do you believe is the, has the greatest mystical experiences? And people will float, that's what I meant. They'll flip. You know, they were a follower of one Rebbe, but then they visited another Rebbe and they were totally taken with him. And so there is a kind of fluidity within the Hasidic movement of people changing um, Rebbes. So this is a big topic. In other words, there is a thing called Hasidism, but there are different streams both of thought and of practice, and there are different leaders. Okay, so it's actually complicated. Okay. Thank you. All right, so so turning to today, um, so there are a lot of questions about within um, within the ultra orthodox community. You know what what to the secular world, um, right? Everyone wears the same black hats. Um, where where are these divisions now? You know, not 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 discussing people like us, um, but you know, I, I notice in you know in the secular press they'll always refer to ultra orthodox Jews as Hasidic. Um, are you know are these are these divisions still still alive and well? Well, referring to all ultra orthodox as Hasidic is yeah is shorthand, but really not accurate. Um, first of all, they don't look exactly the same. You know, only the Hasidim, or most Hasidim, wear the fur hat, the strimal on Shabbos, whereas the non-Hasidim, the, uh, the lit box, the Lithuanians, usually wear a black hat, even on Shabbos, they're not wearing 
the, the strimal and there are differences in appearance and in dress. You know, it's the Hasidim who have the long payas and most Mitnagdim have beards but do not have payas or not long payas, in, in America at least, in Israel. Um, so, um, so there are differences in, in appearance. And uh, remind me the rest of the question. I often get uh, this. Uh, 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 so it's about what differences remain today. Is that the question? Yeah, what differences remain? Is there still tension? Um, how, I guess, how, how big are the relative, are the groups relative? Oh, yeah. How, um, um, it, it, well, there are more Hasidim than Mitnagdim in Israel, that's for sure. So the Mitnagdim are uh, not to be dismissed at all. Um, so the, I guess numerically there are more Hasidim than Mitnagdim, but the Mitnagdim in America have different yeshivas, uh, uh, which are the basis for their uh, communities. But these things can still, every once in a while, you know, get stirred up again. I mean, the, the Hasidim and the Mitnagdim have two fractions of the same po of, of their political party. Agudat Yisrael is a political party running now, and they're not called Agudat Yisrael, they're called Yahadut HaTorah, the Torah of Judaism. They're now running in the elections next week in Israel. But that, that party has two fractions, a Hasidic one and a Mitnagdic one. In other words, they come together to be on one list in the elections, but actually during the year, you know, and they have an agreement, how many Hasidim and how many Mitnagdim on the list for, uh, so the, the, the distinctiveness is still very clearly there. And sometimes there, um, you know, the one of the great rabbis in Bnei Brak, a, a Mitnagdic rabbi, you know, he's the one who quipped, uh, you know, what religion is uh, closest to Judaism? Lubavitch, right? In other words, obviously a very dismissive thing, you know, it's not Judaism, but it's the religion closest to Judaism. So the tension still can come up in different ways, uh, even today. I must say, if I'm allowed to take it back, for me, what's more, in I'm interested in the religious differences, but I am also interested in this problem of internal Jewish violence. For me, that is a very instructive kind of chapter. What are the boundaries of how we interact with Jews with whom we disagree? I think we have different boundaries, thank God, than they had in the late 18th century. Um, but it's very, you know, we, we want to think about ourselves as a tolerant and pluralistic community, but we haven't always been a tolerant and pluralistic community. And that's what, uh, for me, this chapter is very uh, instructive to think about. I think I, when we tend to think about um, otherness, uh, otherizing, uh, othering within Judaism, I think this is a group that we, or two groups that we often think about, but we we kind of put them together, right? We, and by we, I mean anyone not ultra-Orthodox. Um, we're all equally rejected by all of them. Um, and, you know, we've, we've split um, so far. So I guess, I guess two questions um, in our last few minutes. One, is, is there any practical difference anymore between these two groups in relation to the non-ultra-Orthodox Jewish world? That's one. And two, uh, you know, there's, even if you step outside the Jewish world, there's so much division now relation, in relation to COVID and politics, and there's, there's so much separating. Um, so I wonder if you can talk about any of that in relation to you know, the separating of the past. Um, I don't think these two groups today have a very different view of, you know, conservative Judaism or reform Judaism or secular Zionism. I think uh, by and large, that's what unites them. I was sort of implying it at the end that what keeps them together is the fact that there are other kinds of Jews that they they can now together vilify, that they can other. They used to other each other. Now, together, they can other the modern Jews. I don't think there's much difference there. Um, uh, uh, the, 
on political issues, it, if there's an issue to keep in mind, um, I, uh, I really don't, and I know it's a different topic, but it's, it's not a COVID topic, but it's still a general topic is, um, if there'll ever be renewed negotiations on, um, you know, with the Palestinians and on the fate of the territories, I actually think the ultra-Orthodox will not be a problem. Uh, they do not have a dogmatic view of, you know, on Eretz Yisrael HaShlemah. You know, they have other demands. They have lots of political demands from the Israeli government and they were supporting Netanyahu, but that's for, um, for pragmatic reasons, not really for ideological reasons. I do not believe they're part of the hardcore right. Um, in some ways, their focus on these religious issues um, de-emphasizes for them the importance of these territorial issues. So they're a political force to be reckoned with. And you're right, it's very hard to have dialogue. Uh, it's a very hard to have dialogue. You know, we work so hard to have um, interfaith dialogue and that's, that's wonderful and that is important. Um, but uh, I hope we on both sides of that fence can find a way to have, it, it, it can be private, I don't think public is possible at this stage, to have dialogue with Jews that seem so far and so exotic from us, that we do that and that they begin to do that as well. Um, this might be our last question, but um, someone is asking that, about, that there's, there's a suggestion that if the Vilna Gaon had not, um, had not reacted so strongly and interceded that maybe the Hasidim wouldn't have become what they became, which I, 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 I honed in on this question because of what you were just saying, how we, you know, we, def we define ourselves in opposition to other groups. Um, so I wonder if you think that that was, that that was a factor in the growth of Hasidism. Uh-huh. Oh, it's definitely true that a lot of the growth of Hasidism was because of young people uh, running away from their parents' homes and trying something new. Uh, what I'm trying to tell yes, the um, uh, forbidden fruit is very tempting. In other words, it's not, you know, it's not the main factor, but it's definitely true when you say, don't go there, don't visit Hasidim, do not go to the Rebbe's, you can be sure your teenage son or daughter, in this case, son, will go there. So in that sense, I agree with that, that that was a contributing factor. When you make it taboo, it only works against you. I don't, I'm sure the Vilna Gaon didn't intend it that way. But yes, he made at least visiting Hasidic courts and getting the Rebbe's much more enticing. There, there are a lot of questions um, or, and comments about about JTS and the conservative movement, and our, you know, are we are we the Midnagdim and and Chabad or the Hasidim? Well, that, I, I, I respond made... to one person that I think we're uh, we, we sort of, we're we're into that forbidden fruit now. We've evolved a lot, but maybe the, maybe you can have the last word on that. I think we're both. I think that's what you know because that's what the beauty of conservative Judaism that we're able to synthesize what to other people look like contradictions. I mean, I imagine 50, 60 years ago, we would have said we're more, much more mitnagd. Um, but I think, you know, what the trends of the last 50 years in this movement is much more Hasidic. It's about the spirit. It's about prayer. It's about song. And uh, so um, I think, you know, that's, you know, the strength of our movement is that we have both of those features. Beautiful. And I think that... Um... There were comments about Chabad too. I think with the whole, uh, you know, sort of transcending the walls of the synagogue and engaging people where they are. I think that's such an emphasis. There, there's so much emphasis on that in our curriculum now. So, so I, I, I like that note to end on that we've that um, that at JTS we've kind of embraced the best of both. Um, but there's certainly a lot a lot to think about in the legacy of division here uh, for us today. So thank you so much for this, you know, this deep and just really fascinating um, trip to the past that helps us reflect on the on the present. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for attending.
Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Um, Pesach, Passover is of course approaching and next week's session with Rabbi Eliezer Diamond will focus on, um, on, on the focus in the Haggadah on our legacy of being persecuted by non-Jews. So his lecture will, uh, you know, will focus on that focus and sort of how does that um, position us and, and make us think about our relationship to the non-Jewish world and we focus on that persecution. So thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you so much again to Professor Fishman and we will see everyone again soon.